All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's call. So today we are joined by Maven 11, pool delegates on Maple, to celebrate and discuss the launch of their new pool. Uh, so what we're going to do is dive into a quick run through of the agenda. And with me from the Maven team, I have Victor and Gabor. And then what we'll do is once we've uh, run through all the key items, we'll, uh, we will leave time for QA at the end. So if you do have any questions, uh, do drop them in the ask a question box at the bottom. And so what we'll run through on today's call will be a deep dive into the new pool. So we'll look at who the borrowers were, what their profile was, how the Maven team went through uh, credit risk assessment and how they manage risk um, in an active way uh, in their role as pool delegate. They are also running two other pools on the platform. So we'll talk through the status of those pools and how they track through the recent period of volatility. And then we will round out with a look at what is next for Maven on the Maple platform. So with that, let's dive in. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sid. Thanks for having us um, here. And um, yeah, obviously, we're, we're very stoked to be uh, to be part of uh, of the whole Maple family and um, yeah, and, 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 and work on, on many nice things to uh, to come. So maybe one one or two uh, words on, on, on Maven 11 before we dive into uh, to the Maple pools we run. So we are a Amsterdam based uh, venture capital firm. We run about uh, 250 million uh, over two, um, you know, purely block blockchain-focused uh, VC funds. Um, one of our investments around, uh, I was saying, I want to say a year and a half ago, I think it was the March 2021 round. We uh, we invested in 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 Maple. Um, obviously, very excited about what they set out to to build, um, and um, we we wanted to be part of that. Um, in a, in a stronger way, so we, we we decided to become one of the first pool delegates on the uh, on the platform. Um, so we started in July 2021 with 20 million bootstrapped from institutional investors. Started to lend that out to uh, crypto native businesses, and obviously experienced together with uh, with the whole Maple platform, yeah, a very strong growth. Um, so that led also to us to scale up our credit underwriting business. Uh, at Maven 11, so we now run a team of five uh, people, of which uh, myself and, and Gabor you have in front of you. Um, we all have strong Tread Five backgrounds, um, and um, and 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 we take our job obviously very seriously. So we're scaling up even further by by always hiring hiring more talent uh, to uh, to run our pools in the most prudent way. Um, so maybe this is a good time to introduce myself a little bit. I, I have. 16, 17 years experience in capital markets before I joined. Um, so very, uh, very excited to be on this side of the uh, of the fence. On the, versus my old trade fire uh, job, um, and um, yeah, helping to grow um, our credit business on on Maple, uh, yeah, to 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 new heights. Um, and with me today is Gabor, who, uh, who who can tell a little bit about himself as well. Yes, very happy to do that. So I'm, I'm Gabor, I'm Hungarian, uh, also based in, in Europe. Uh, previously also had uh, a TreadFi career in leverage finance, private credit, had uh, responsibility for a 2 billion loan book uh, with a large uh, European bank on, on yeah, the high risk credit side. So have you know, been focused on credit underwriting, uh, risk management, portfolio management, and also work out so when uh, problems occur what to do then and um, yeah also crypto native as well and i was uh, you know very happy when i saw what sid planned to do two years ago and i was even happier when when he actually connected me with maybe 11 and i i i joined this team in march uh, last year so i've been here from the start and uh, yeah it's, it's a very you know, good feeling to to be part of of such a journey. No one no one could have dreamed of what we achieved um, all the way through, and also, in particular, with the stress test we have seen, it, it it is incredible. And yeah, I'm very proud to be in front of you now today and present this this pool launch. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. 
Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Gabor. Um, so maybe to set the stage real quick on how we as a pool delegate fit into the uh, Maple infrastructure and who does what exactly. So it all comes down to that Maple is, is obviously an infrastructure, uh, but obviously cares a lot about what goes on on their network. So they onboard um, on a KYC and AML basis, borrowers and also in our new pool uh, lenders um, to make sure that that is all in, in check. Um, and, and when we all agree on a certain certain borrower, the, 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 the bilateral uh, negotiations about a loan, about the term, about the rate, et cetera, is, is, is upon us. So we run a, a fairly traditional credit underwriting business, but we obviously use the efficient uh, platform and software and code uh, that, that the Maple team built. Um, but we analyze uh, thoroughly uh, a balance sheet and the financial and Gabor will get more into the into detail later on. Um, and, and that is our responsibility. So obviously we work closely together, but um, the underwriting part is uh, separated from the actual onboarding part, if that, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so we have a lot of industry relations um, built up over the last year with potential interesting companies that, that would like to uh, use the platform to finance. Um, we, we know a lot of capital, both crypto uh, native and outside that would like to, uh, to uh, capture the yields that we generate. Um, and last but not least, we're, we're, we're very proud that we, uh, we can show a clean sheet since inception. So no, no defaults or, uh, or missed payments uh, since. Um, so with that, I think it's a good time to jump into the new pool that was launched uh, last week. And uh, that is the, uh, the main uh, uh, objective of, the, of today's call. Um, so we want to take you back, maybe as Gabor alluded to a little bit on the to, towards the, uh, the the last couple of months. A lot has happened in our industry, um, um, especially in, in in the lending and borrowing side. Um, and you can imagine we were running a uh, by in April a 300 million USDC pool, um, and basically right after the first you know headlines around Luna UST. Uh, Celsius thereafter, 3AC, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can imagine that put uh, a lot of uh, you know, stress on the whole uh, industry. Um, and um, we faced uh, also a pretty challenging environment by, uh, by having to manage through this, uh, through this, uh, this period. Um, during that period, you can imagine that we spoke to our borrowers basically on a day-to-day -day basis. We really wanted to have a finger on the pulse basically on on how they were faring what were the positions what were their exposures were there anything any unknowns that we should be aware of so we got and even closer to to our counterparties than than we were already before so in that light we saw two things basically we saw on the one hand that uh that our borrowers were actually faring uh, and navigating very well throughout the, this turbulence. Um, and on the other side, we saw uh, liquidity uh, that they need for their, their trading operations dry up. So that led us to believe that, you know, there was a, an opportunity here where we were still as an underwriter, very confident with our set of borrowers uh, that we were dealing with. Uh, and on the other hand, there was, uh, uh, again, a tremendous shortage on liquidity, i.e. Um, you know there was a spike in rates so we figured you know is there still appetite from institutional capital looking to to capture um these these uh, above market risk adjusted returns um and are we still comfortable with uh with with our loan book well uh, obviously both answers were, were yes so we set out to to launch a new fund where we were uh, pre-selecting basically the, the top uh, uh Market making and trading firms out there that we that we uh, that we grown even closer to during the during the, the times of stress. Um, so that led us to to uh, to loans issued to Wintermute, uh, the uh, one of the larger players in the in the space um, based in in, in London, uh, Aras, which is a, a, a Asia Australian uh, trading uh, group, um, and for the first time. To our knowledge, uh, uh, Flow Traders, uh, a list, publicly listed uh, company that, that that for the first time we think uh, ever took a loan on uh, on the DeFi uh, reels. So this is a, a milestone that we're incredibly proud of, and um, obviously, uh, uh, yes, yeah, 
strengthens our belief that we're on the on the, the, the right path forward towards uh, bringing you know on-chain capital markets to the to the masses. Um, yeah, and this re reversed a big trend, didn't it, of uh, contraction that we've seen over the last couple of months, didn't it, Victor? In terms of lending, you mean, Sid? Yeah. Yeah, in terms of overall lending in the market, I think we saw Absolutely. a lot of liquidity was flowing out, and now this, this kind of marks the first major loans that are being taken out. Yeah, hundred percent. So um, in our in our discussions with with institutional investors, um, there was still, uh, as I said, a demand to get exposure to this very interesting um, set of borrowers. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, there has been a little bit of more cautiousness uh, among among them, given what happened uh, in the industry. But that's why we, you know, um, made the case for actually the performance of the set of borrowers has been. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty uh, disconnected from the uh, the overall industry's uh, challenges, and their their profitability actually uh, remained at a very uh, solid uh, level, as well as their, yeah. uh, uh, their 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 overall leverage. So we were very comfortable in issuing loans to these uh, these guys again. Yeah, that's a good point, and I, I, just a couple of things to touch on that I can see here on the slide. But what is continuous continuous monitoring and active management? Uh, mean in this context with Credora and uh, Borrow Financials? Yeah, no, very, very good. That is, uh, that is all what we do all day, right? So there's, there's, we use um, first and foremost our, our financial analyses. We get monthly financial statements of over kind of parties that we analyze and we, we monitor. Um, there's also a more qualitative uh, aspect to it where we, where we make sure we, we. Uh, regularly meet with with our, our kind of parties in person we we check upon how they how they care about risk management etc and then uh, on top of that we use a very interesting tool uh, built by credora that is a a, uh, a real-time risk monitoring uh, platform where we can in a privately and cryptographic way basically uh, check uh, live on portfolio construction and net exposure of these market makers on various exchanges so we can get without seeing their actual underlying positions uh, we can get a very good good sense of how levered they are and and uh, their overall uh, strength of um, of their balance. So um, we use more traditional ways of analyzing, coupled with these more uh, innovative ways that uh, that, for example, Credora used. Yeah, and uh, those traditional ways that wouldn't include just looking at a statement of NAV, would it? This is actually looking at the borrowers, you know, financials on a monthly basis. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is why we have a team of five now, uh, yeah, working basically around the clock in uh, in making sure that we uh, we stay uh, very close to the ball with all of these and uh, make sure that we understand every asset that, that they have on the balance sheet. Very good. There's not five people looking at the NAP statement. Yeah, uh, self-certified NAP statement. Uh, yeah. No, very good, very good. All right, well, let's let's uh, continue on. Yeah, so now we uh, maybe good to see the next slide that we um, yeah we we we, we uh, see very strong momentum on the back of this launch. Um, it's it's very interesting to see both inquiries from potential lenders and borrowers on the back of this already. Um, I think the transparency that we as 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 Maple provide huh, by showing every loan in the loan book. Um, um, has been instrumental in um, in, in getting uh, institutional investors to uh, commit capital to this type of lending again versus perhaps a more opaque uh, situation that we uh, that we saw with uh, with CFI uh, desk where it's not entirely clear where the yield was coming from. So I think the combination of that um, has led to a lot of positive press and good momentum. Um, and um, yeah, it's good to see. As you can see by the, by the various news uh, mm. coverage, that there is a lot of attention for uh, lending and borrowing picking up in DeFi. It is, it is interesting. I, I see a number of these headlines mentioning, I think just about each one mentions DeFi. And for a little while, DeFi was a bit of a dirty word over the last couple of months. But it seems that one of the major narratives picked up on by the uh, press is actually the, the relative outperformance of DeFi versus CeFi. And some of that seems to be attributed to one, as you highlighted, Victor, the transparency and the fact that all loans are on chains. You can't have a, uh, a secret borrower that nobody knew about who bobs up and turns out to have been 50% of, uh, of your loan book, nor can you have you know quasi hedge fund type activities that nobody was aware of 
that their deposits were being used for. Right. No, it's just it's it's uh, as I said on the previous slide, right? It's uh, we absolutely make sure that there's no uh, directional exposure, either like a direct or indirect from any any over counterparty. Mm. So, and it's good to see that that it seems that DeFi is now also better understood by the press because back around Celsius, uh, DeFi, CFI. Um, especially in the more threadfine media was just put under one uh yeah one headline basically so that was also uh, uh we had to we had to do a lot of education around that and explaining that we were uh, you know uh, running our business in a completely different way so i i'm, I'm pleased to see that the likes of uh, you know yahoo block works now make a clear distinction between the two yeah yeah no very good all right well let's let's press on and, and look yeah. at uh at how lenders viewed this so uh, it seems that you had a lot of lenders who were quite confident in participating as depositors in this pool. Uh, why was that? Yeah, so as elaborated uh, in this conversation, you, if you want to get exposure to this asset class and you, you are a firm believer, you have basically two main routes. Like one is going through uh, CFI, so you deposit funds with Celsius, BlockFi, wherever or you can choose the DeFi rails, which is the you know, smaller part of the market, but the you know, clearly more transparent, the verifiable route where you don't have these hidden exposures. And I think this is one of the major uh, factors that makes it so attractive and so appealing. You know exactly what you're getting. It's, it's, uh, it's not something that's behind closed doors. You get full transparency on who the borrowers are, even the rate, which for borrowers actually can be disadvantaged because it's public at what rate they're willing to pay. But overall, like we are a strong believer that more transparency leads to yeah, a quicker and more solid maturity of the entire space. If you just think about TreadFi, loan rates there in the public market are also transparent. So why make shady deals behind closed doors? That That is a bit of why we believe that this is way more advantage uh, advantages. So it's it's not a black box. Um, we conduct full due diligence like a threat for institution or credit fund would do, as Victor elaborated. And in the course of this pool, um, we, we spend a lot of time educating the lenders that already were part of the pool, also partly new lenders, um, to um, yeah, um, regain their confidence or, or even strengthen the confidence that was still there. So it's, it's absolutely natural that, that lenders go risk off if... Uh, every second day there is a new big blow up in the press so but um uh, it, it was a, a a big challenge uh, but also opportunity to to regain or to 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 get this confidence back and the comfort and what we did was to yeah prepare digestible information uh, about the due diligence we perform there's, there's nothing secretive about it it's just more like an institu institutional grade of reporting that we used to approach uh, the, the the lenders or potential liquidity providers, and uh, that certainly helped us to convince them about the risk profile of the, the counterparties involved in this pool and was, uh, I think, crucial. So it was a lot of education. It's not just opening the pool and people deposit, but it was really a lot of interaction. And during the time of, of preparing this pool, we had lengthy interaction with both sides, for us and uh, lenders, and that's what also made us feel very confident that that this, this, it's a perfect time to launch this product, and also the you know all the parameters are it's yeah it's it's perfect for the for the current time. Um, the, the borrowers we selected based on the experience we gained through the you know hurricane that we all went through, and um, we met in person uh, with uh, uh, almost all of them. Uh, uh, we uh, spent a lot of time uh, had almost real-time interaction during during the weeks where the shit hit the fan. And this helped us to, to really understand the business even better and make us very confident to, to, to select them. So, so there is a clear, um, yeah, there's also kind of a reward. Uh, so there, there is demand for liquidity, but we, we, we really felt that like these borrowers, they especially deserved it uh, based on the collaboration and the partnership that we have have had we had really good collaboration with all borrowers uh, i think that's important to note uh, so we, I mean, we we managed this uh, whole uh, uh, time period very well but um i think they, they stood out in terms of quality and flow traders as a publicly listed company i think uh, uh, it's, it's visible publicly how, how strong they are and there also personal relationships exist so we we are very confident with this strong set of borrowers mm. 
And and yeah, I mean, Flow being a, a publicly traded company actually posts its financials um, publicly on the uh, on the investor relations part of their website. Uh, yeah. So that added degree of transparency. But maybe just diving in because I think the the segment that you lend to, so market makers, market neutral funds, is perhaps a little bit opaque to a lot of people who are participating in crypto. But what does that what does that actually mean? And how is a company that is doing market making or market neutral strategies different mm-hmm. from a three AC? And therefore, you know, why were they able to perform relatively well and mm-hmm. uh, and most you know, most continue just business as usual over June, July. Yeah. So uh, I think in summary, like the majority of all the problems that you know came uh, above the surface were lending related. So companies that did various types of businesses, including lending, uh, did did something wrong in the lending business. And, and that's that caused these holes in the balance sheet. Whereas market makers who are, uh, uh, typically arbitrage trading, uh, delta neutral, i.e. it doesn't matter whether the market, it doesn't matter like indirectly, but like it does not directly matter whether the market goes up or down. Uh, they uh, extract profit from from dislocations and price across exchanges. Um, so there, there is a completely different risk profile compared to uh, a three AC, for example, that was um, massively involved in in lending, or then even a Celsius who who did a lot of loans to counterparties that turned out to be more risky than they thought they were. So with the market makers, we um, we have across the board seen a really good management of the entire situation. There have, I, I mean, it's obviously there have been also issues or or. Um, situations where they really had to you know work very hard and monitor it also very clearly what what they're doing but there, there were no like similar situations where they lost money in in this magnitude um so this, it, they, there are risks involved obviously but they were managed very well very professionally and also communicated to us all the way through a like, great transparency so we had a really good grip there and uh, yeah so so we 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 and also the lenders are very confident that this asset class uh, performs very well and has a really good risk adjusted uh, return mm. Yeah, it it is worth noting. So it's it's that in each case leverage is used. So three AC use leverage, market makers use leverage, but it's two different it's two different kinds. So in one case you have for market makers they are using leverage to collect you know three to five basis points a trade, maybe sometimes more if there's less liquidity. But they're doing that. What they're doing is they're providing the service of liquidity, and so they're borrowing Bitcoin and USDC that is traded on an exchange to collect, you know, three to five basis points per trade. Um, but they're using it to generate a cash flow. Whereas the likes of 3AC and some of these other funds were using leverage, but where they were going to make money not off cash flow, but off capital appreciation. So it was borrowing exactly. one asset, using it to purchase another asset, and then hoping that that asset that you purchased massively appreciated relative to the amount that you borrowed and that you owed. So it's, it's you know, two different types two different ways of generating profit. One obviously was more sustainable. One would produce outsized returns in a bull market, but, you know, can wipe you out if you uh, if you hit a downturn. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's about uh, taking exposure versus taking a position, basically. And market yes. makers, they take exposure, extract value through exposure, but they are not taking a directional bet, which those who uh, face issues did. Yeah, yeah, they became bag holders. Uh, all right, awesome. Well, let's uh, let's go on to the uh, to the next slide on risk management. So, Gabor, continuing the thread, can you tell us a little bit more about the process that you have in place to manage risk? Because being that this is a platform where we, you know lenders are taking credit risk against these borrowers rather than an over collateralized platform, I think it is really important to stress how risk is managed here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it starts with the really good collaboration we have with the Maple team. Uh, so where you know, KYC is, is is handled uh, as as teamwork, where a borrower gets onboarded to the platform overall. So it's not the onboarding with maybe eleven, but it's also an onboarding where other pools could potentially then also issue loans. But this represents a guarded approach, i.e., that there is two pairs of eyes, or actually even more, that are monitoring and and screening candidates uh, that uh, 
want to borrow funds from from Maple. So this, I think, is a first and very important step that it's it's not one CEO deciding, yeah, we need to give a loan because we want to grow TVL, but it's it's many people involved. Uh, and many people do, you know, sanity checks, like whether this is a suitable counterparty or not. Um, then we agree on the master loan agreement. And um, this is also industry standard to have something like this. We always felt that um, that uh, the lending standards could be could be more tight. They like elsewhere. And we have seen like the, you, you referred to the NAB statement that was sent to one other lender in another situation. Um, and we, we, we are not satisfied with that. So so we insist on having monthly uh, financials, like a full balance sheet, getting a PL and l um, to, to really uh, get a sense for how their financials uh, develop over time uh, and also track it over time. And, uh, you know, we like use every opportunity we have to ask dedicated questions and, uh, yeah, have a really good dialogue with, with our borrowers. So um, yeah, so so that that I think makes a very important part um, in the in the permission use DC pool that we that we also maintain on the platform that's also open for for deposits from the broader DeFi audience. We also have very clear rules internally for us or policy set on concentration risk. So we we do not want to have like a single borrower that has an outsized. Uh, uh share in the pool uh leading in the case of default like leading to a to a, a very high loss so in the now launched permission pool there is certainly an, uh, a concentration but that's just due to the fact that we have really handpicked a small number of uh, uh borrowers with whom we are also working obviously in other pools so i think that the you know, concentration risk here can be can be mitigated um uh in the same time, we're also screening, obviously, the concentration with within the borrower. So, uh, like, uh, is there any concentration on token exposure? Uh, is there a concentration in exchanges uh, where where they employ the capital, et cetera, et cetera? So, we really try to dive deep and to really understand the business whether there is 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 a is a concentration. So just to give one example, we we turned down one interested borrower. Um, not because we knew what's going to happen with UST. I, I mean, we, we like no one could have known what happens, but there was just a 30% concentration on, on it was yield farming activity on UST or on Anchor. And we just, you know, it, just by policy, it was just too high. And that was the reason why we turned it down. Just to give you one example from the like real world, how it, how it happens. Um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, I think that gives a flavor of, of how we how we assess. Um, and, and then we have sort of the, I would say like threat fight type ish of, of internal analysis where like a team of five people uh, spends the time on. We do qualitative, quantitative analysis. So qualitative means all the factors that I've just explained, concentrations, et cetera, management team, who are they, uh, what is the track record, uh, what are they trading exactly, et cetera, et cetera. And the quantitative is then more the financial analysis where we get the financial reportings and and you know monitor how how the uh, balance sheet positions uh, develop over time, how profitability is, whether it makes sense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have also physical interaction, as mentioned before. So we, we try to meet up with the uh, borrowers in person just to know that they really exist. Uh, I think this is a very important lesson learned again uh, from, from the whole crisis that we went through. Um, and uh, also, of course, have very frequent digital, um, digital meetings. Um, the, we uh, manage the uh, portfolio, as Victor alluded, uh, with uh, uh, obviously our, our own uh, analysis, but that's then supported by external tools, one being Credora, which is, I think, the most prominent tool in the space, but we're not stopping there. So we always try to lever uh, other sources of information as well. So we do reputation with screening with another database, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we really look out, given that we are a VC firm, we uh, have a really good overview of the entire ecosystem. And if we see something that makes sense, like we try to you know, actively build the ecosystem and actively improve the, the tools that we can uh, use in order to make a better job. Yeah. It's worth noting, what, what do you see? So if you look at Credora and not naming any specific borrowers, but what is, what is Credora showing you for the average market making firm? Yeah, so you get the, like an aggregation of their, of their assets. So you can see what is the, the net exposure that they currently have. So if they send us a balance sheet or an NAF statement where it says, yeah, we have 3 billion, but through, through the APIs that they have links with, with exchanges, for instance, you would 
immediately see that you know this this cannot be the case. This obviously requires an onboarding with Credora, um, and we have a really good uh, link to the Credora team that uh, and and you know actively help in establishing these APIs and establishing the links to the system. So one thing you know that, like seeing the 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 net assets, seeing the like uh, development of the of the equity, like this this is the stuff that you can monitor with with it in in yeah real time. Mm. Yeah, no, re really, really good to know. And for a uh, for a healthy financial profile, like when you see a borrower's management accounts, what are you looking for? Is it cash flow generation? Is it healthy level of leverage? Is it liquidity? All of the above? Yeah, it's all <laughs> basically. So um, it, it, it doesn't matter if you have like 100 million of trading capital, but you have no track record of profitability. So um like the market makers we're interacting with are very established so they have they can show you on a daily trading basis their daily revenue or like profit or loss and um it's absolutely not a problem if there was a unprofitable day like <laughs> if it's too many it is a problem but if you then we then take the time and walk through every day like what happened when you lost money what went wrong what did you learn what did you improve and uh, mm -hmm. if you have a borrower that has not a track record like this, um, uh, you can assume that they need to go through this learning experience first. So yeah, yeah. Um, having profitability, uh, having uh, sufficient equity and own equity, uh, own skin in the game. And we like in this pool, it's all triple digit uh, uh, in terms of uh, million dollars. In the uh, permissionless pool, we also go uh, and, and uh, interact with smaller counterparties but uh, still i think like um I, I, they, 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 there's no borrower of less than like 30 million of, of equity which is sort of real like own money that is at stake yeah yeah so this this pool was kind of upsize you know we, we referred to it before as champions league so that's like 100 million plus in equity buffer and then the the first pool that you launched uh is smaller smaller but still you're not looking at fresh startups right this is no. 30 million plus in sort of minimum net equity amount okay that's great well let's let's go on because um just conscious of time but you guys are managing two other pools so let's go in and you know just taking a moment to talk about the other pools that were run of course both of which were running through uh may june and july period of volatility but can you share an update on those pools victor Yeah, no, absolutely. And and just for the sake of clarity, everything that we just discussed applies also to to these pools, right? All the all the risk management, all the financial analysis statements, uh, all the comments that were made by by Kabor and, and Sid. So, um, yeah, the U. So our, our permissionless USDC pool obviously faced some 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 volatility uh, around, um, uh, especially after you know lenders got a bit. Uh, Cold feet with with Celsius and others were freezing uh, client assets. Um, so we are um, we're satisfying all uh, withdrawal requests. Um, we see now an inflection point where since the markets are sort of getting back on their feet, um, and and given uh, also uh, I like to think our communication around how comfortable we are with with our counterparties, we see a bit of an inflection point in that the withdrawals are are slowing down and deposits are starting to uh, to flow in again. So we're pretty confident that that over the next weeks we'll be able to to start pricing new new loans in that pool as well. Um, That's right. I said it's a, uh, uh, it's a more broader. You had a big deposit yep. flow into the uh, into the wrap deep pool recently, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. That's also something that uh, that is very worth, worth mentioning. That's also basically why we set out to to start this pool as well. The Nexus Mutual, uh, which is a large insurance uh, uh, company, um, has deposited or is, is on the verge of it, it went through the vote already. Uh, Ten percent of their ETH treasury, so that uh, is around the, uh, what is that thirty million uh, in, in USD. Um, so. This is a great example of, of how we, we we can offer above market uh, yields on on ETH that sits idle otherwise. Um, and um, yeah, we, 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 we see a lot of demand from uh, the same market making and trading uh, firms to uh, to to pay increased uh, 
rates on those uh, on, on, on those loans versus uh, versus maybe uh, two three months ago. So that one is is, is looking to uh, to be to be back up and up and running. Um, what you can expect from from us as a pool delegate going forward is that in, it, we, we remain in pursuit of, of radical transparency and investor relations efforts um, in, in updating um, our, uh, our community and our, our, our LPs in, in how the pools are constructed in the sense of what is the aggregate um, debt to assets or debt to equity, for example, to, to, to make sure that you can get a good over time like uh, uh, view of how that developed, um, what have been the historic yields. Um, so you can definitely expect uh, more uh, more of that uh, going forward. It's something that we uh, that we pride ourselves on uh, on doing. Um, and again, um, no defaults. Let's uh, we work hard every day to uh, to keep a clean sheet. Um, and um, yeah, we have many more ideas uh, for the for the future. But um, you will uh, you, you will you will see those when they get into effect. Um, but we're very, very, very confident that we've seen absolutely the worst uh, in terms of, 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 of fear and contagion risk out there. Again, we, we, we were and have become even more confident that the, the counterparties that we, that we select and work with uh, are fully capable of, of weathering these type of market conditions. Um, and that, um, yeah, when, 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 when I, I think there's even, Looking back into maybe end of 2021, when when, when crypto was uh, was well bid, um, the, the rates were even higher. So I think it's a, it's a it's a matter of time before we see those higher higher rates in the market again, and hopefully we can uh, we can capture even higher yields uh, at, a, at a still very uh, attractive risk adjusted uh, um, metric. So yeah, we see good things for the future. Um, we uh, we keep working hard. Um, to uh, to run a prudent ship. Yeah, very good. And I can see, so on that slide, you've got the QR codes, uh, which people can scan who are watching if they want to uh, be taken through those pools where they can deposit either USDC or, uh, or wrapped ETH. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is very good to note that, you know, I think the uh, fears of contagion have started to subside, and that is best represented by one, this new pool kicking off, as well as people starting to deposit into the uh, into those two existing pools, the USDC one and the wrapped ETH one, and uh, and the significant drop that we saw in uh, in queued withdrawals. So it's worth noting you held off doing uh, doing new loans while withdrawals were pending. You, of course, one of the key things to note here um, that differentiates DeFi from CeFi, you're not custodying these funds after all. So as loans are repaid. Uh, depositors' funds can't be frozen. Um, they're not commingled with other assets that Maven holds, which might be going into venture or other business lines. So it is a pure borrowing and lending business line here without custody. So uh, you know, nothing can be done to, to block anyone from retrieving their deposits. And uh, I think that contributed in a huge way to, uh, you know, to these pools continuing to function smoothly over June and July in a way that uh, just wasn't replicated in CFI. Yeah, absolutely. Every dollar that was ever deposited in our pool was fully accounted for and visible on the app and on chain. So we could point exactly to where at any given moment in time uh, our funds were, were, were linked out to. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And people could see in real time the performance of all borrowers and that none were stressed or uh, or late on payments. Very good. All right. Well, I think we've got a few uh, questions that have been racked up. So let's start looking at some of these questions. So I'll read it out for the benefit of those on the call. But we've got a couple from Grant to begin with. And so we have what lessons were learned during this recent crash? Can you implement things that further strengthen Maple? So uh, I'll touch on a few things. I'll touch on the business side as well as the, so the business and commercial side, as well as the smart contract side. So on the smart contract side, some of the things that we saw that we want to, uh, to implement improvements on would be the withdrawal mechanism. So ensuring that people are able to take out a pro rata amount so that it's not first come first serve on that. The other thing is we wanted to improve the cover mechanism so that 
it could be up to 100% liquidated and it wouldn't be denominated in MPL. So you don't get that wrong way risk if there's a market downturn. Um, but then on the business side of things, uh, what, what has been implemented is strengthening the information requirements and reporting requirements, as well as uh, the events of default present in the loan agreement. Now, this was less possible before because the the environment six months ago was probably much more where power rested much more with the borrowers, whereas I would say it shifted back towards a bit more of a risk off mindset. And that enables you to strengthen the kind of documentation and covenants that you have in place. Uh, so those are a couple of things. And then uh, the other one is, of course, diversifying outside of just the, the regular sectors. So we want to cover uh, more uh more borrower industry. So this could include minor finance. This could also include Web3 infrastructure or, of course, uh, fintech companies. And that just gives people who want to lend on the platform a few more options to choose from. So Pools V2, uh, which is a major engineering undertaking, is going to be released before the end of the year. That's the uh, that's the team's internal target. And it will carry through a lot of those improvements that um, that we've discussed. Uh, second question from Grant. So I like Goldfish and Clearpool too. Is there anything they're doing that you could see Maple implement in future? So uh, I think definitely what both of those protocols are doing is, is quite interesting. Clearpool tends to use more of the single borrower pool um, idea, which is something we'll probably we've, we've actually decided to shift away from because we think that diversification in borrower pools is actually you know, delivers better risk management for uh, for lenders. But that's just a design choice. Goldfinch, I think what they've done really well is uh, cater to sectors outside of just crypto natives. And that's kind of reflected in in what I mentioned about us uh, pursuing sectors like minor finance or uh, or fintechs so that there is just you know, a, a broader set of industries which are being served by this infrastructure, which is ultimately our view. It's that crypto infrastructure is going to replace regular financial infrastructure or rather blockchain enabled infrastructure will replace regular um, legacy financial uh, tools like the SWIFT system. And uh, the best way to do that is for an apples to apples comparison where borrowers who might otherwise go to credit funds or banks would use you know, a maple pool to, uh, to borrow for their expansion. This pool, third question. So this pool only has three borrowers. What do you think of the high concentration risk of the portfolio? So I would say uh, and Victor can jump in here, but the pool launched with three borrowers. It will not have three borrowers in perpetuity. It will be growing. It's just that you can't stack it with 20 borrowers from the very uh, beginning. Uh, so whilst there is higher concentration risk for now, um, over time, as more deposits come in, that di level of diversification will increase. But uh, what mitigates that was the really high caliber of initial borrowers. So you have Flow Traders who publishes their financials. They are a publicly traded company um, and uh, has you know, a very, very healthy balance sheet and an extremely strong reputation, both uh, in the traditional finance world as well, where they do significant global market making activities, as well as Oros and Wintermute, who both fared extremely well over the recent volatility and have exceptionally strong balance sheets. I'll, uh, I'll just I'll continue powering through these. So we've got uh, another question. Given your stringent borrower selection criteria, what is the expected number of borrowers that can meet the criteria? This is a tiny bit of a self-referential question, but um, I think maybe the maybe the right way to answer this is that there's probably a much lower approval rating than initial interest in uh, in borrower applications. So there's significant screening of borrowers, which roots out those who are not market neutral, who you know do not have at least, in this case, 100 mil in, uh, in net equity on their balance sheet to qualify for this pool, and the regular pool, you know, 30 to 50 million in, uh, in net equity required to qualify. People who are doing click trading, who do not have in place things like fire blocks and sort of sophisticated custody solutions, um, and who do not trade on you know, across multiple exchanges also wouldn't really qualify because they wouldn't be deemed sophisticated enough. Another question. So does Credora show you borrowers full positions or partial? Uh, so this should be full positions. Now, Credora is not going to have coverage of every single exchange around the world. So there might be you know, some tier two or tier three exchanges that are not covered, but 
This is designed to provide really high level of coverage for the bulk of large traders. So it covers all the major exchanges um, and therefore you should get a, a view of, you know, a very large majority of a, uh, of a client's position. Let's say, so, you know, uh, I'd be pulling a number out, but I would estimate that should be well north of 85 to 90% of a, of a uh, borrower's trading positions. Yeah, and what and you see there is, in, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go, go borrow. Yeah, I know what, what just, just to you know, give, give a bit of a picture, what you see is you, know, you, you see the separate sort of accounts of the borrower with, for example, Binance 1, Binance 2, Binance 3, BitMEX 1, Bitfinex, uh, 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 Fireblocks, et cetera, et cetera. And you see the, the dollar amounts, right? So you have granularity on the account level uh, and, and, and that helps you to verify uh, how much money there is in real time. Yeah. Yeah, so it is a uh, it is a, a really powerful real time tool in terms of seeing, um, you know, minute to minute uh, how a uh, how the health of a borrower's book looks. Uh, second last question. So we've got: Are we looking at growing first loss pools in case of defaults in future? Uh, yes. So it's worth noting uh, that you know in in this um, in this business, which is institutional lending, you do underwrite to a certain level of defaults, and that's why the interest rate is priced that in a portfolio of 100 borrowers, some of those will default. Typically in an institutional setting, this might be a one to 3% would be, you know, kind of your target range. So low single digits. Uh, but uh, so what what uh, we're looking to do there in the, uh, in the medium term on the protocol is shift to tranching because we had cover, but what we found was that cover was not pricing high enough uh, for depositors to go and to go and seek that subordinated exposure without diluting too much the uh, the interest rates that were being earned by the senior. So instead, what we'll move to um, once pools V2 or once uh, Maple V2 is implemented is a look at tranching where you could have a subordinated tranche that is lent out. It will be thicker in size, so it will you know, wouldn't be fully wiped out in a default and therefore would offer more protection to senior lenders. But because it's being lent out, it would be able to earn a higher rate than if it's just a reserve of cash that is sitting there in a smart contract. So that's, uh, stay tuned. We'll have more information on that as uh, as development progresses, uh, but that is longer term where things are going to head. Uh, and then I can see we've got one question, which I suspect is an insider question, but will the Maven team uh, Victor and Gabor be at Token 2049, and uh, can people meet the uh, meet the team there? Absolutely, yeah, we're, uh, we're we'll be there with the uh, with the full squad. So if you're uh, if you're around, uh, drop us a line, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll happy to meet. Um, and this yeah. is also and part of our. drop you a line via that email. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. And this is again also part of our, as we said so many times before, to meet with our with our borrowers and 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 also with with LPs. But um, you can imagine there's uh, there will be a lot of um, of our kind of parties will be present there. So uh, we will we'll take the opportunity to to meet with them, to to catch up, to to ask questions again, and strengthen the the overall relationship. This is what we did with permissionless in Florida, uh, where where every quarter we're in London. Uh, so it's 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 uh, it's all part of the effort to get um, to know our counterparties in the best possible way. All right, very good. And we've got one final question I can see from Ain't Got No Agua. Uh, so, any thoughts on Maple branching into providing other tradfi infra like international payments? Uh, so, uh, if this is just reinterpreting the question, if this is uh, prov Maple providing finance to uh, tradfi infra. Uh, then that that is the case. So this would be part of what I mentioned with the uh, the fintech pool. We would be looking to support companies that are doing international payments and remittances, as well as other kind of web two um, fintech uh, type subsectors. Whether it's um, you know other forms of credit underwriting uh, or finance or international payments uh, or you know traded products. Like I think that that sector is one that uh, we're kind of interested in catering to and uh, where, you know, some conversations have been had around what kind of fit, um, what kind of fit uh, a maple pool could provide there. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll thank everyone who joined. Um, thanks so much. If you have any questions, either send them through to Victor or 
send them through to uh, to the Maple account, contact at maple.finance, or hit us up with a DM on Twitter. But thanks, everyone, for joining. Gabor, Victor, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it and found it super informative. And I will bid everyone a fantastic rest of their day. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care, guys. Take care.